So we'll turn to Hurling and we're delighted to say that Derek McGrath has made some time for us and uh, we're very happy you have uh, made time for us because, geez, looking at this fixture calendar already, you're not going to have much time this year. No, Joe, no. Not with, uh, I suppose, not alone the permutations with, with the league but the new championship format and I suppose the adverse weather that we're all experiencing in the next few days. You're kind of left in a little bit of limbo as regards the club scene as well in April now. So, look, mm. it, makes, it makes it interesting if nothing else. Yeah, it will be eventful. I was just looking back there. Uh, the, my favourite, and I, I use the word favourite delicately here because I'm sure you won't thank me, but my favourite photo of 2017, uh, in, uh, from the GEA world certainly, is, you might know what I'm going to say, is you and Dan Shanahan on the pitch at Crow Park at full time. Have you seen that pic? Oh, I have, I have, Joey. I have, I have. Uh, for people who haven't seen it, it's a pretty iconic one already. It's uh, you guys are standing on the turf. It looks like you're watching a North Ireland being presented, Lee McCarthy being presented to another team, and you're kind of. <laughs> I mean, it's a, a lovely photo, really. You're kind of nestling your cheek on Dan's shoulder, and there's tears there, and his face is similarly upset. Can you remember that moment, or is that one that you only saw the picture afterwards and thought, "God, I didn't even think anyone was looking." Yeah, I know. I, I remember because I've been told about it I don't remember it at the time I suppose mm. I, I laugh I, I almost cringe now sometimes about it because not that you lack the kind of ultra uh, kind of coolness of, of a Jim Gavin type figure but I suppose you, you're trying to learn from it you're, you know it was a very emotive occasion and I think the thing behind that I suppose Joe as much as anything else is when you have a family like, like we've experienced maybe like Mayo have experienced and you look at a team like Wexford when they got their chance in 96 or Clare got their chance in 95, you feel extremely pessimistic about your chances of getting there in the future. So I think that automatically I was nearly thinking about, you know, how hard it is to actually get there. You know, and I think that, that kind of, as much as the lads have put a, put a huge amount of effort in and we'd all put a huge amount of effort in, it was as much not taking the chance while it's there. And, and fairness to God, they didn't give us that chance. But, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's as much as, as kind of a an emotional kind of bubble of, of of what can become as well after it. You know, I think that's that's the, the thing that, that that's uh, very evident, you know, for me, you know. Yeah, I'm glad you explained that because I was going to ask you what on the face of it would have been a very stupid question because there are different reasons why losing an All-Ireland is upsetting for different people and I was going to ask why in particular could you remember were you upset? So it's interesting that even in the immediate aftermath that was crossing your mind that these chances for a, a, a county like Waterford are very, very rare. Yeah, and that's like, I think, we've been in the All-Ireland 1948, 57, 59, 63, 08, and then ourselves last year, so it's just it's so hard to get there, you know, and I suppose people are people have been enthused based on the kind of, the relative youthful influx into the team in the last few years, and, and the relative incremental progress, I suppose. But, it, you know, there has to be a level of kind of pragmatism there in terms of, you know, when, how, how high you go and how high you can go and, and I'm not being pessimistic about the future in any way I'm not being I'm just there has to be a sense of realism as well so I think that that kind of immediately comes into your thoughts because you say to yourself can you go again can you can you reach that summer can you find a different way do you need to find a different way and questions pertaining are very obvious questions nearly mm. straight away and you know given the type of character I am and most of the, the lads are on the panel that's the same type of thing you'd question all over a winter of not discontent but a winter of wondering I suppose and that's you know that's that that's that's where we find ourselves now. I suppose even after three defeats in the league and one one victory, you know, just finding a steady path towards some sort of sort of kind of path towards kind of mm. getting the best out of ourselves come the summer. You know, I rewatched the interview as well you did with um, Claire McNamara, and you said you'd just come from a devastated dressing room, which we can all imagine. The personality types who tend to play inter-county hurling and uh, manage inter-county teams will obviously have a resilience and a kind of get-up-and-go attitude and, you know, like a can-do type of attitude. Yeah. Across those uh, that hour, 90 minutes, I suppose, maybe in the dressing room at full time, is it just complete unequivocal devastation or at any point is there a bit of resurgence and we'll go again last year we'll go again next year rather lads you know we, we, we've done well we'll go again and kind of G each other up or is is nobody ready to hear that at that point yeah I think this is my fifth year I think we went through probably if I was to go the time scale of it and just make it as linear as possible like we, we probably heard that for three years up to the All-Ireland Final from different avenues of our dressing room after matches we say in year one we were beaten by Wexford and Kilkenny it was a 
it, it was a general perspective was, you know, look, we need to work harder. Year two, we were beaten in an Ireland semi-final after winning the league. Year three, we were beaten in an Ireland semi-final by Kilkenny. And it was the, the general, you know, dressing room talk was, listen, we'll go again. Whereas I think Kevin Moore, in fairness, our, our captain, we had spoken in the morning at the All-Ireland about not being passive, you know. Mm. In actual fact, we were very passive in, in the opening stage particularly. And we just said, no matter what, we'll come out of our comfort zone, not to be passive, etc. And we've given a little bit of perspective, like most management teams do, in terms of, you know, appreciating what we're doing and enjoying it and all that kind of crack, if you like. But yeah. Kevin spoke about that that's what living is about. You know, and it sounds a bit corny or over the top, but he, he kind of took the floor, took control of the dressing room and said, that's what living is about, lads, ups and downs. And there was real perspective there. So I think there was a kind of a sense of moving on. I'm not sure is it the right thing to say, but the capitulation of 2008 in the All-Ireland Final, like I remember being in our dressing room at half-time, not playing well, but a point down, or, or level, can't quite remember now, and talking about, you know, with, you know, making reference to 08, oh, Murphy and Dan were both involved that day, and talking about that we hadn't capitulated, we're still there, not playing well, and we can go now from this stage to pass, possibly win the game. So I think there was a kind of sense of, you know, which is maybe a water for fault, almost not patting ourselves on the back, but certainly kind of saying, you know, we hadn't disgraced ourselves, go away, we're better, and that's what living is about, and, and a kind of a moving on almost, you know, even though we knew how difficult it would be to, to, to kind of follow it again this year, but there was a certain moving on in terms of the gesture. But Kevin and the players set the tone, but not not in a in a manner where we just need to come back and work harder last year. It was almost kind of like what what happens in the next few months. If we live, we live. If we if we have a you know if they have a good social scene back with the club element of it for the next few months, we do. if we get a team holiday, we get a team holiday. So there's no. It was more just kind of living with the ups and downs of, of life as much as hurling, which is sounds a bit over the top, but that's what it was, you know? No, it, it doesn't sound over the top at all when so much of your efforts and your, your kind of thinking and your life is invested in it, you know? And like, sure, it's hurling on one level, but it's, I mean, it's, it's so much bigger. It doesn't really matter what the sport is when you've come together as a group. It's a very special thing and you work really hard to do something very difficult. They sound like wise words from Moran. He's obviously a clued in fella. Yeah, he's top man. He's a great fella, you know? And... and you know, uh, even you, you learn as a manager, Joe, as well. I just remember in the first year going in, and I'm a De La Sag club man, obviously, and just just even the learning folk, the, the, the folks, I, I, I took, Kevin was captain at the, from, for the year um, in 2014, and I went in in 2015, and I took the captaincy from Kevin almost as a kind of a, not to be perceived as having a club man as captain. You know, I, yeah. I, I look at the naivety of myself almost, you know, and I, now I gave it to Michael Wall in the break he was brilliant captain and brilliant trainer but you know I, I would have worked closely with Kevin since 1999 I was actually his coach for the for the Fale team that won the Fale with De La Salle in 1999 when he was only 12 and you know he was he was the born captain it was just finding yourself as well and I remember the second year I just went back and I said both to Michael and Kevin that you know I, I remember saying that I think Michael would benefit not alone from moves to the forwards but from not being captain and I just acknowledged the mistake of not having Kevin as captain because I always find he's just He's a fellow who, who has high standards, huge standards, but he has that ability to bring people along with him as well because mm. he's very self-aware, you know, very self-aware. Yeah, well, look, I mean, you'd be the first to say you've made mistakes right the way through. I mean, that's kind of the, the oh. journey. Hey, what an interesting thing as well that before the game, you're talking about let's not be passive. Like, for, for whatever else we do, let's go out here and get outside our comfort zone and make an impact and make it difficult and really just rip through the next 70 minutes. And then I'm sure you've racked your brains. You're, you're conscious of it beforehand and then still somehow, whether it's the occasion or not, there's a, there's a passiveness to, in comparison with what you can usually produce as a team. I, I'd say that's mm -hmm. caused you sleepless nights. Why the hell does that happen when you're also aware that you, you, it's something you need to safeguard against? Yeah, maybe the key is in, in not talking about it as much as we did. You know, our, our did you, you talked about it a lot, did you? No, well, we talked about it on the morning of yeah. the game. Like, we kind of, like, the, the general run-up to the game, kind of, uh, everyone was espousing the fact in Waterford, you know, it wouldn't it be great to win it? You know, and we tried to steer, it'd be great if we won it. So it was almost kind of like, there was no definite. It was So we, we kind of took the approach that we'd really just go at it early if we could. As, and, you know, you'd almost... You didn't want to get off to the start that they that they got off to in two thousand and eight, and mm. as as young, as a, young, a relatively young management team as well, and me all as as young as us on the opposite side, I suppose we were saying even our own body language four or five points down after four or five minutes of saying, "Geez, we need something here." But the other thing I suppose is you looked at your own preparation as a manager in the run up to the semi final. There was a huge debacle and debate around 
Tighe's availability or not. And we really focused on the emotive uh, kind of, I suppose, influence that Tighe has had on our group over the years. And we really went hard on, on what it mean to his family to get to the final, etc. And we almost mirrored that with Conor Gleeson for the final. And we might have tweaked it a little bit overly emotionally in the dressing room with, with Conor. And, you know, I just, just, and, you know, I just remember kind of feeling perhaps that we'd maybe overdone it in terms of, you know, you hear about the Schmitz and the Gavins of this world with this three or four minutes of cool, calculated, mm. process-driven words of inspiration or words of, of direction on the way out. And whereas we were probably fairly, fairly fired going out to the All-Ireland final based on, as I said, on Conor Gleeson's unavailability. And, and, um, but you know what? what? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Say, say this kind of cool, calculated the Jim Gavin, the Schmitz, uh, this this kind of maybe coolness you might aspire to. I guarantee a parallel universe, we're having this conversation where you had been very cool and calculated and kept your pre-match talk to two, three minutes. And if you'd went out and performed as you did in September, you'd be saying to yourself, why the hell didn't I just get people fired up and into, into some kind of emotional state? Ah, oh, yeah, but this is, I think, so this is only part of, of the kind of self-analysis that you do as, as a manager in your learning process in terms of where, where you'd like to go. I don't think all of a sudden now... I'm in a dressing with half time or in before a game, cool and calculated. It's more a kind of a mixture of of both and yeah. learning from some of the greats. And it's not in any way being derogatory about how people go about their business. It's more, and you're right, you, you look back at the last few years in terms of analysis of Ireland finals, Jackie Tyrrell's half time speech has been cited as an influence when Kilkenny were behind against Galway. Yeah. Other people, Johnny Sexton for, in the Northampton game, I think a number of years ago, yeah. there's lots of things that are cited as regards being influential when the reality might be completely different you know it might be the fact that we all just woke up and we, and we performed and what nobody has considered perhaps is that God we just got to the pitch of the game uh, in a whole better way than us and, and mm. you know we're a serious outfit in, in the first place you know that's the thing it's not, it's not like you're operating in isolation I mean Galway had a lot to do with uh, what yeah, happened so yeah. uh, we so what's the fallout like then? What's what's the, what are the next few weeks like? I mean, uh, I, do you realise that you're uh, somebody with no perspective and you're devastated for days and weeks on end? Yeah, you're a bit. You're, you, you, we came home to a relatively good homecoming, which gives you a kind of psychological lift. I think the people of Water are very good. It was almost like not there was a turning during the summer. Like we played Cork on the 18th of June last year. We underperformed. You know the, the 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 backlash at local level, which is all which it always is at local level. We understand that wasn't great in terms of how we had played and how we performed, etc. We grew as the championship went on, and the crowd there was a real connection between ourselves and and the public. So when we came home, there was you know lots of people. You'd, anyone you'd meet in the street would say to you, "Excuse me, you have to go again next year." That close, and mm. inside you're probably saying, "You know what? We're not as close as you think. We're we're, we're after developing a good." team and we're working hard etc but the reality is there's other teams that are coming and and you know and you're, this is the kind of quandary that you're left with in your head if you like in terms of yeah. where you want to go with the team and and the team teammates or the, the players are, are similar if you like you know and i think that's we listened to a lot of that over the few weeks so mm. in terms of detachment there was little or no detachment away from anything other than you know constant talk about it so it's very difficult to get away from i can only imagine what it's like in mayo given their <laughs> you know quest for it over the years so it's probably something similar to that so that's what it was for a few weeks certainly just certainly no detachment away from it you know in your head for much of 2017 it was going to be your last year am i right in saying that 100 percent, yeah 100 percent. when does that start to nag at you and, and shift um i i the night probably of the banquet if i'm honest you know and it sounds very um not naive to say it, but almost kind of impressionistic to say it, it was just a kind of a digging in on on the, the, the pressure came from the outside, from the players, from from other management members, from just the public, and and it's still in my own gut. I was kind of saying, "Geez, I wonder if I've given it as much as I can actually give it." You know, and, and um, personally, like I'd taken off some parental leave, much publicised parental leave. I had my wife was on a my wife was on a two day week in in the bank, and. You know, there was things to be kind of sorted out. So it, it probably took me. I think I said I, I met the players on the on the thirtieth, around the 29th or the thirtieth of September, about four weeks afterwards, and just said, "Listen, I need to sort out A, B, and C if we're going to commit to this, blah, blah, blah." And yeah. I gave no commitment at that stage. And then I started to come around to myself, like in my own gut, to say, "Jesus, I, as much as anything else that you'd be able to look people in the eye, it's very easy, I think, to go out on." 
the relative high of being in Ireland finally. Yeah. You know, and and, yeah. and more for things, in terms of your own personal kind of how it looks for yourself. Oh, your you stock, know, your stock is sky high. Yeah, if, you, if I give you the scenario where where I'm in the stand la- at, at the end of the Kilkenny game t- two weeks ago in Welsh Park, you know, I, I, you know, and I'm gone, and they've lost three league games in a row. Yeah, and you're, you know, people are kind of saying, Jesus, you know. Oh, Eric McGrath was not as bad as perceived. Yeah. yeah, you're a genius. So, so I think, and, 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 and fairness, I had a great conversation with the Brick as well with Michael Walsh. Who I just, I've seen so many examples in life of people going out and kind of looking at their own, their own need for for kind of self, not self appraisal, but appreciation, etc. Whereas Michael. There's never a question. Every year he just goes back. There's never a question of, like, if he left the scene, for instance, there'd probably be a statue erected to him in Stradbally, his mm. hometown. There'd be, there'd be all the, all the, that he deserves. But he just never is afraid of, of risking failure, if you like. And I think that's a that's a brilliant sign, you know. I think that's a... And I just... You learn from the players. And it's about being able to look the players in the eye as well, regardless of how the year will go or not, and be able to say to them at the end of the year, well, Jesus, lads, we gave it absolutely everything we have like and it's about respect and that has to come from your own gut first and it did come from my own gut but, but I felt I left it drag a small bit in retrospect now I should have made a decision early October and just said it you know I, I looked at Rochford's decision he almost made it made it on the night of the banquet he said we'll be back next year mm. I gave no definite stance on it because I hadn't made a definite stance on my gut so it took me a little bit longer but um, I, I, I'm definitely definite on it you know and I have no yeah. regrets for being in the job I want to make that abundantly clear you know there's a bit of self-criticism in, uh, at various junctures here I notice um, I think you're more than entitled to, to take your time but it's an interesting insight maybe into to how you think why yeah. why why did you want to leave was it just because um, you've got a family and, and a life like or, or were you emotionally tired or drained by the whole thing why was yeah, the plan to go I, I, yeah I think to it, just a little bit and you don't want to be making yourself out to be absolute any type of superhuman but no sure just a, a re-energization was needed probably just a whole just, you know, a whole kind of look at yourself in terms of how you're going about it, you know, the emotion that you're investing in, the time you're investing in. And then I have a four-year-old and a, and a, and a 12-year-old boy and a wife, obviously, as well. But, I, I, you know, you're wondering how much time you're putting into those as well. And that's never a question, to be fair. There's never a question for my wife saying you have to come away from it or anything. That, that would never be. But you almost feel that the ordinary things, like just tapping around at the back or yeah. kicking around at the back, those are... I always find them... With the boys, I'm always just bringing them to a play, you know, a play area, or you know, we've run them up here and some more. Whenever I have, whenever I'm, you know, playing with them, it's always something extravagant. Now I mightn't say a play area, you mightn't might sound extravagant to yourselves, but it's all, it's never the ordinary kind of mundane things of signing the homework, looking at the homework, checking the homework, helping out. You know, I'm never there for those things, and I, I, I'm the school I'm, I'm I'm teaching in. My own young lad is coming into first year next year, like in 2000. And, um, September 2018. If you yeah. like. So that was part of the decision as well. It's, it's bad enough being a, a son of a, a teacher and I've been a son of a manager. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> tough going. So I don't want to kind of put him. So there was personal reasons as well, and there will yeah. be in time. But yeah. that's um, that's the nature of that. But I wouldn't be put under pressure. Um, by the family in any way, you know. Yeah, because intre- I don't know. Did you read um, Podrick Harrington that Ro- the interview did with Rory McIlroy a couple of weeks ago, and um, he was saying the one thing he thinks about now is. God, am I going to turn around in five, six years and regret not having the day-to-day contact all the time with the family? And there's, I guess there's no way of knowing. I know his is a slightly different situation because he's often out of the country uh, for maybe weeks on end. So it's it's slightly different in your case, I suppose. Yeah, it is. And look, I, we have our parents you know, boy, I, I, I could collect young from the oldest class from school, brought them to my mother's, and then I, he'd be in bed when I come home. So it's not, it's not making ourselves out to be some sort of hero either. Patrick Harrington's life, is, in terms of pro golf, is a, is a series... You know, in terms of travel sure. scenarios, and you know, it's, it's a different scenario. But it's 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 a day like today you'd appreciate. It sounds corny, over the top, but you have a snow day here. You're you're out in the snow, and you can have a bit of crack with the tube, and, and you're kind of parking the, the hurling and and for for a number of hours and that. But that's 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 what you'd kind of look forward to in time, without being without wishing the year over mm. in any sense. You know, you're just you'd look forward to maybe you know, like like my oldest son now would would 
plays a good bit of the Xbox and the PlayStation. He plays a small bit of hurling, and I'm saying to him, should I be pushing him with the hurling? Should I be pushing? Hmm. And you, but I don't want to be pushing any young lad into anything he doesn't want to do either. So that, that look, that they're all parental issues, I suppose, as opposed to, but they're probably balance issues in terms of how you go about the job as well, like any manager has. Yeah, of course. I, I don't want to kick off a parental leave storm again here and have debates on the radio <laughs> about the demands of intercounty <laughs> uh, football or hurling. Are you? So you, you're back teaching, are you, for the year, or what's the plan? No, I was back till January. I'm out now at the moment, Joe. Yeah, I'm back. I'm back out again, so I can. Right. I can. I'm. I'm on parental leave at the moment. Yeah. And so, what do you want to say now before a headline kicks off that says McGrath forced to leave teaching again <laughs> due to intercounty commitments? What, what, what's the What's the point you want to make about what, it? No, there's no, there's no. I just I had 14 weeks left on my my youngest son, Oren, and look. I think I've told you already in terms of without making it a big deal like yeah. it's probably my last go at it like in terms of 2018 so I just said 14 weeks I'll give it you know I, 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 in between that I have a midterm break I have the two weeks Easter holidays I have the last week in May so it's it's only about a 10, 10 and 10 week parental leave as such and I just said I'll give it 10 weeks of absolute effort and get the balance right more balance right in terms of spending a bit more time with the kids as opposed to the hurling and mm. that's not becoming that's obsess, obsessive with the hurling but I think the prerequisite of parental leave is that you have two children, and that's why why you why you're, you're there to look after them as such. And I think I'll, I've, I've been spending a little bit more time with them, trying to help a little bit more with them, if you like. But yeah, that, that's that's the nature. Just give it everything. I made a mistake last year because it became a whole debate on <laughs> professionalism. And, yeah. You know, but look, that's that's the nature. You know, and maybe maybe I've indirectly made a mistake again, but that just you can't hide behind the truth. You know. No, fair enough. Uh, one last point, Ed, just I wanted to ask you before we just touch on this here. Then briefly is it's interesting you mentioned uh, Mayo and Rochford because Mayo are probably the most talked about football team in the country. They're very mm-hmm. interesting in a number of ways. Like even if you just look at it in a cynical way from a media point of view. If we're talking about different teams, there's so many angles to Mayo. There's so many stories. There's so many interesting discussions, and equally. Uh, Waterford, not least because of the conversation ongoing about tactics and hurling, are this very interesting mm-hmm. team. So uh, you're actually under the spotlight more than a lot of teams. Um, yeah. Is, is that a drain? Like, Because I know you, you you definitely defended the tactics and the approach at a, a few points last summer. So clearly it's getting through and you're hearing it. Are you utterly frustrated with the conversation about your approach or is it water off a duck's back this stage? Or is, is that part of the drain? It can be a drain, yeah. It can be a drain. It can be frustrating. It can be funny. It can be um, informative. Um, depending on the analysis or depending on who's involved, it can be... I think what gets lost in the whole debate in terms of the, the debate around systems, etc., is is the need, I suppose, or the allowance for people to flourish within a system. You know, and I, I was, you know, I've seen some of the rugby analysis over the last number of weeks. You know, when you look at someone like Ogara when he analyzes, you know, he talks a lot about structure. I know we're talking about a different game, but he also talks from the inside of the, the Schmidt camp when he was there as a coach, I think, just prior to Christmas. Yeah, or, or in the summer, during yeah. The tour. He talks about that ability to be able to, hey, listen, there's an opportunity here to come outside the structure. And that. I think sometimes that's maybe not put forward enough. You know, I, I like, for instance, we've been in five finals in four years, Joe. Two months of finals, two National League finals. Um, and all are in the final. We've only won one mm. in 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 the world of Savin Village. You'd be sacked. You know, you're gone. You're, you're you know, if, if, if in the world of Premiership. But it's we last year the lads won. You know, uh, not that All Stars matter, but they won five All Stars. And I feel sometimes that the balance in terms of people not equating that talent coming to the forefront with the actual system. You know, and as opposed to you know the system is curtailing them, and that that's the reality of what we feel is best for us as as a team, if you like. And, you know, I, I don't think people would do enough in-depth analysis in terms of tweaks or evolution of it, which which we do as a team. And we actually live, we, we, we live amongst ourselves as a group, kind of trying almost to explain ourselves. And, and sometimes when you're explaining, you're losing. Yeah. It's, it's very important to just kind of stick the head down and keep going and persevering uh, with it, I suppose. Like if we were heading into a three or four year term, Maybe you try and revolutionise and, com- and change it completely, but you know when it's a one-year project, you're probably just saying, "Listen, I'm going to try and squeeze what I can out of this with with relevant uh, tweaks along the way." You know? mm. um, clock slightly against us here, and I've, I've kept you for long enough. So uh, oh, th- the league campaign thus far, obviously the, the three losses, and I, you were pretty upfront about this would be experimental to a point, and there was one game where no substitutes uh, were used, and then. You beat mm-hmm. Cork most recently, which must be nice all the same, even even in that context, to get two points on the board. Uh, like the, the striking thing about 2018 
It is an unbelievable challenge for managers in, in both codes with the Super 8s, but in hurling especially for the Munster managers. Uh, for, it's an unbelievable challenge for you, for uh, the fitness teams, because you are into the unknown and you know, the the winners are going to write history here and whatever approach they took, everybody's going to say, well, that was the right approach to the league and the, and the year. But even then, that's a tiny sample size. We could be 10 years before a pattern emerges over how to approach the league and how to approach the whole thing. And I'd say that is, I mean, geez, talk about a whole added layer of complication to your life. What, what are your thoughts on it all? Yeah, it's yeah, I think it's really enforceable that you have that challenge. I think that I, I'd welcome that challenge because... Take for instance, we we are playing on the twenty seventh of May. We're we're the last team out in Munster, and we're finished, or not finished. Hopefully, but we're our last, our fourth group game against Cork is the seventeenth of June. Yeah. Whereas last year we played on the eighteenth of June in our first round of the Munster Championship. So we have twenty one days, four games. Yeah. To essentially decide how our how our whole year goes like and last and, ju- and just to interrupt actually very quickly I'll let people know because I know you'll know this but um, the way your season falls this way in, in Munster your uh, your break week your gap week is actually round one so you go yeah. into Clare away seven days later Tip at home seven days later Limerick away seven days yeah. later Cork at home and who the hell knows where you'll be yeah and and you could win two games lose all games and it, you know and I think you have to prepare like we said to ourselves as a group we'd say the weekend of the Kilkenny game that we have 21 days now with the Kilkenny with Cork we don't know what's happening this weekend we're presuming we'll have Clare and we'll have the most likely a relegation battle the following and we were trying to mirror the 21 days in terms of not just preparation because we're trying to train through the league whereas I'd imagine during the championship time you'll be recovering on the Monday analysis on the Tuesday etc you'll be almost camp like if you like in terms of your preparation in the, in the summer so yeah. we're trying to just from a psychological point of view but I think that's what makes it very, very challenging that you're trying to prepare for those in terms of the building of a squad, in terms of even information about how you should play against particular teams that you nearly need to be getting that information for the summer out to the guys now. Mm. This is the way we're going to approach because you'll miss them for three weeks in April, the 1st, the 8th and the 15th of April, there's club matches in Waterford. Right. You'll have little or no contact with them and the reality is you have to prepare to make sure that you have... And I could see a situation, Joe, where you're playing, say, for instance... Um, we're playing clear in Ennis on the first Sunday and you you might have five or six changes the following Sunday not even based on guys not going well against Clare if you like just based on that's what you've planned you know and I think yeah. that's that's the nature of it and that, that's that's the challenge for, for us if we can get guys up to that level to be as competitive as we haven't been thus far in the league so but that'll be interesting and plus there's the whole anomaly or our unknown in terms of whether we'll be home or away yet it's not quite decided in, in, in Waterford circles you know and would you rather be at Walsh Park I, I keep hearing this, the tight pitch maybe isn't ideal for your style of play yeah look, it, it, see it, it, there's loads there's loads of things to be kind of considered I suppose there's the there was 73,000 for instance at our all Ireland semi-final against Cork last year an all Ireland uh, semi-final record mm. so this year the capacity for Walsh Park would be 7,500 it looks like so there's the whole not disconnect our connection between the fans. There's a revenue for the local city to be considered, for the city to be considered. There's what's best for us ultimately, you know, in terms of the, the fields. And there's the possibility of it all being taken out of our hands based on capacity issues or health and safety issues in terms of the Munster Council and the county board. So yeah. it's a debate that's 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 that I'm I'm not in a position to kind of I suppose be able be able to answer at the moment. If you ask me a question as a coach, if you're training in a place all or from the fifteenth of April and for five or six weeks ahead of a home game, does it give you an advantage? I think it does. OK. Listen, we're right out of time, but um, it was, it's always a pleasure. Fascinating to talk to you, and I'm sure we'll catch up at some stage. Thanks a million. Mind yourself. Hey, hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball. If you want to subscribe, and you should, check out just up here. All our latest stuff is just down here. Generally, knock yourself out. <laughs>